Um, hi. Uh, well, hello. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Nick. Um, uh, I think I think this is recording. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I just have to preface. I am. Uh, I'm I'm not I I'm not like a long term Pendragon fan. I've only been in, a fan of the band for the past couple of years, but um, so I'm pretty new. But then again, I'm 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 fairly young, so I, I guess it makes up for it. But um, uh, I am absolutely obsessed with your music, uh, <laughs> completely. I mean, and um, you know, I myself am a guitar player and a singer and a musician, so I I kind of I I can sort of see another side of all the greatness that you do in terms of your live performance but also just your songwriting and everything like that and, and i'm just a huge fan um so yeah um uh i i do have um some some uh just to prove <laughs> that I, I i mean i i don't have every bit of merchandise from you guys um in fact i splurged a ton of money on a um some signed cds and some vinyl but um i do have a, a live at last uh and more uh oh, which, yeah yeah the the i think like the first proper kind of dvd that you put out uh which is uh, it was yeah uh, you know back in the uh 90s um we we did that uh came out as a video first um and then uh we didn't have a video i mean a lot of the other bands you know, have video around about that time, but we didn't have we didn't have the opportunity to do one until um, I met Tommy uh, from Metal Mind Productions in Poland, and um, he said uh, he could get hold of the studio, this uh, TV, television studio, TV studio, and we could uh, record a show there and put it out as a video. And of course, you know, we were over the moon because to make a video recording was really expensive. You know, in terms of dollars, I don't know, maybe in dollars, maybe forty-five thousand dollars or something crazy. Um, so you know, he offered to um, to do that through his company, and um, yeah, so we got good lighting and a great venue and a good stage, and um, it was it, it was great. Yeah. yeah, and then it became the first DVD as well. So good. Yeah, and and I think this was during the the Masquerade Overture tour. I think. Uh, yes, it would have been. Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah. 1996, I think the tour was. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this was kind of uh, one of the first things I, I saw from the band, and, and I was, I mean, totally blown away. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the first album I heard from you guys was the Masquerade Overture because that's kind of your most critically acclaimed album. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, and I heard about it from multiple sources, the, the Prague archives and, and some other. Uh, notable mm -hmm. sources but um uh yeah i i love that i love um uh, uh past and presence is uh is fantastic uh the the 21st is a nod back to um, yeah our, our old stuff with the um uh you know, former band members as well which made that very exciting to do that was great yeah absolutely yeah no it it's funny. I, I, you know, actually, I, I do have a question about this. After watching um, the the Past and Presence DVD, I gained um, sort of a new appreciation for the early period of the band and your debut album, The Jewel. Um, yeah. Was it surreal to play that music with those old band members, those old musician friends of yours, uh, twenty one odd years later? Um, not as surreal <laughs> as it should have been. <laughs> A lot of the songs um, we had actually played just about everything over the years. Um, you know, it's not like when they left, the songs went out the window. I mean, we carried on playing them. So, you know, stuff like Black Knight and Circus, we were still playing that, you know, long after, uh, you know, Rick left and, you know, Barney as well. We were playing uh, stuff like Excalibur and um, Dark Summer's Day. So, you know, it didn't really feel all that abnormal. Um, I mean, it, it, it was just a great thing to have everybody in the same same building, uh, you know, playing those old songs. And it, it, was a, it was very exciting because it was very relaxed as well. 
you know, everyone kind of wanted to enjoy it. So, you know, a lot of those things often are, you know, when we did the first 40, it was the same. That was very enjoyable as well. It was it was kind of quite relaxed. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I, I mean, even to see the in the in the extras you play with uh at the at the Rifts Bar UK with Nigel Harris. Yeah. Just to see <laughs> yeah. that whole lineup was so yeah, cool. It was incredible because Nigel um we tried to persuade him to come and do the show in Poland, but he wasn't having any of it. Um, <laughs> and he was kind of a bit worried about, you know, whether there'd be enough fuel in the aeroplane to get us to Poland and what kind of food there would be. It's just like really tough questions. <laughs> um, but we did manage to persuade him to, uh, you know, come to Rifts, which is about 15 miles from where he lives in a place called Stroud. In Gloucestershire so you know it was kind of easy to do that but I'm glad we managed to get something with Nigel for that uh for the extras but we also managed to get him back as well to do a few numbers with us on the uh first 40 as well which was you know up in London so you know yeah that was that was really great I mean Nigel's an amazing musician that's just amazing drummer he's an amazing musician he um he retains an incredible library of songs and music. I mean, you can ask him, you can say, hey, you know that um, that police song, um, you know, Every Breath I Take, you know that third quarter? He says, oh, I think that might be a B-flat minor. And you play it and you think, he's right. You know, he, he's, he's incredible. He's, he's got perfect pitch. You sing a note, okay. you can tell you what it is. Um, he, he, I mean, I, he, I, I haven't really very met many people like like that. And as a talent, um, you know, his drumming was unbelievably imaginative. He would never really, you know, play. He would, you know, play straight down the line uh, when he had to. But you know, more often than not, he, he'd come up with some very inventive drumming. I mean, if you listen to stuff like Fly High, Fall Far, oh. uh, that mini album, stuff like Excalibur, you know incredible what he played yeah or like like yeah. armageddon or or you know the, that that song or you know yeah. Um, yeah i mean there's i mean yeah and i really like the 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 fly uh fly high far, fall far uh mini album uh, the first debut ep that you put out i mean that uh is is a great kind of um introduction I, well well introduction to the 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 band before you had like your first full-length album and, and I, I really enjoy yeah. it and then um yeah and then you also put out um the other the I don't have um the uh, concert Max Maximo or whatever I I don't know how to pronounce it but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 um but I have out of order it comes chaos and uh, oh right. yeah yeah and this is fantastic I mean um because this would have been right after uh, Passion I think um and yes, uh, it was. yeah yeah and I mean to see 2011 I think it was yeah 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 mm -hmm. uh, so yes. and that's now you know eleven years old so uh... <laughs> you're right I mean that is that is incredible. Oh my gosh. But um, no, I, I mean, to, just to see some of those um, songs off of that album be played live as well as some old favorites is just such a treat. And um, that kind of leads me into some other questions that I wanted to ask. Um, uh, well, for one, on the track Empathy off of Pendragon's ninth studio album, uh, yeah. Passion, as I mentioned, uh, you rap towards the end. Are you yeah. a fan of rap? or are, And if so, what uh, artists have inspired you within that genre? Well, uh, it's it's a strange thing because um, what actually happened, I had this period of time where I just wanted to mix things up a bit and bring in a lot more influences because, you know, we've done the sort of grandiose prog rock thing, you know, which, which I, I, I love and I still love. But, you know, I just felt the inspiration to try and do something else. And that was came through. Um, my son and I used to um, do some motocross and we watched motocross videos and uh, some of the music that was played in those videos really started. I thought, this is great. A lot of it was new metal. And I thought, this is really great. It's kind of very heavy, but it's very, very melodic. Um, and I like it. This is some, there's something here which is um, very, very appealing. And my son was also playing an awful lot of rap music to me as well. But, you know, a, lo a lot of really unusual stuff, like um, a, ba a band, they weren't even a band, there was just some guys, I think, in a room in London somewhere called The Four Owls. 
and uh, another uh, guy called Devlin, who's a uh, you know UK rapper. But I, I found, and he was playing. My son was playing a lot of Eminem as well. I thought, you know, there's something in this. There's the message in it is is interesting, and some of the melodies uh, that Devlin had, I thought, were really really good. And maybe what about if we kind of could put something like that in, you know, in Pendragon music. It would still be very much Pendragon, but it just have an element of something new in the toolbox, um, which I like. I like to have that um, sometimes having something just to mix things up a bit, but still never, uh, I'd never sacrifice the melodies or the feel or the vibe, or you know, occasionally I would go back to um, the old ways of doing things, you know, which I did with Love Over Fear. Um, so I never, you know, I, I like to think of adding things rather than changing things. Definitely. I mean, I, I think, I definitely think like um, with uh, starting with maybe like Pure, yeah. the band started to take on a new musical direction, but it was still very much Pendragon. It wasn't. It did with Believe, really. I mean, Believe yeah. to the beginning um, point of making things a little bit different than the, what we call the 90s albums you know yeah this kind of inkling that we were getting that we wanted to try and do something a little more kind of rocky or and then pure was you know out and out you know influenced very much by a lot of new metal kind of stuff mm -hmm. definitely yeah um so I, I I'll ask some more general questions. Um, yeah. who or what made you want to pursue um music as a career? Well, uh, yeah. What can I say? I mean, playing lead guitar and getting girls. That's <laughs> <laughs> what. You know, no, that's why everybody. Well, you know, wants to start. You know, playing rock. I mean, the great thing about playing music as well is that it's it's playing rock music. I mean, it's a hell of a lot better than working in a factory. So. You know what? It's what it's. It's a great thing. I mean, over the years now, I've learned that it also has its own set of troubles. I mean, it's not just kind of a free ride. You know, it's got its own difficulties. Which you know, if you could make a career out of it, you have to try and overcome those. But um, you know, initially, the early kind of seeds of um, wanting to do something like being a musician it's because you want to be creative and you want to play like your heroes you know like Carlos Santana, Jimi Hendrix and you know Andy Latimer from Camel God there's hundreds of Jeff Beck hundreds of guitarists you think wow look what they're doing hey look maybe I could learn that and, you know that it's that's exciting and it's just the thing about that is is it's still exciting now even now I, i'm still listening to Jimi hendrix and jeff beck and going how are they doing that you know because you never ever finish learning so oh, yeah. you know it's an exciting thing and, and that that's what started me off you know doing this i knew I, I i loved music and i knew it would be great if i could turn this into a career so i wanted to do it yeah, no, absolutely. And and all those guitar players that you mentioned, I mean, huge inspirations to me as well. I mean, I, I just, you know, and and even some more some more recent guitar players. I, I think like uh some like jazz guitar players like Julian Lodge or or you know, yeah. uh, some other some other people very just it just really, I mean, just to and and I, I mean, I think you have definitely your own touch to the guitar, your own emotional touch that is unique to you that is unlike really anyone else I ever I have ever heard and it's just so much emotion is pouring out well, that, that's really I mean what, what what I'm all about is I don't really kind of put myself forward as a, a technical player I put myself forward as a songwriter that creates music and within that there's some guitar I mean um, nearly always my first kind of thing with uh, you know writing guitar parts is that well where's the tune you know, where's the melody? Because, you know, where I, when I hear Layla or when I hear, um, you know, Firth of Fifth by Steve Hackett or, you know, Pat Matheny, Are You Going With Me? You know, 
what I'm hearing is a tune. And I hear so many technical players now who can play blindingly fast, but they've got no tunes. They've got no songs. And if they've got no songs, you know, they're not really going to have much appeal um, any further than teaching people how to be technical, which is great, but it kind of limits the love, I think, of what you can do. I mean, you know, it's incredible to sit down and be able to play, you know, amazingly technical stuff, but if you're not imparting some kind of feeling to other people, something emotional or some kind of communication, it doesn't really have an awful lot of meaning and it can get a bit boring. I mean, I, I could, there's some guitarists, I mean, I could watch for 20 minutes and then I'm just thinking, well, you know, I'm kind of bored now, but I can watch people like Andy Latimer, Carlos Santana. I mean, even Aldemiola, you know, Aldemiola is a, yeah. a technical player, but the thing that Aldemiola has done is he's developed. You know, he went through the very technical stuff in the early, um, you know, the late 70s, early 80s. He had that style, and he brought in the more kind of electronic guitar synth almost stuff that he brought in with the, the Manhattan Years kind of stuff, which I loved that as well. And now he's playing a lot of the classical stuff, so there's a lot of the kind of like Latin and vibe, that vibe to, to it with the classical style, but still lovely melodies and everything. So it's still incredibly relevant to me. Definitely, and it's... It's funny that you mentioned that because I think um, to mention the Pure album again, I mean, you have a racer head, which is like totally technical, insane, but it's still very melodic and very interesting. And then you have it's only very easy to play. Yeah. It's, it's difficult to play. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you have like, you know, songs like It's Only Me, which is like just pouring with emotion. And it's just like the, the, uh, the you know, you're such a versatile, eccentric player. And, and even to mention, um, uh, North Star, the the new EP, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of classical Latin influences. Um, yeah, there are. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, <laughs> there, there are some sort of old Miola, you know, with the alternate picking um, stuff in, uh, you know, the beginning of Fall Away, which, I mean, I'm not really that good at that, but I mean, if I can do 10% of what Alda Miola can do I'm sort of fairly happy because it's another tool in the toolbox but I like to learn lots of different styles and what I did for North Star was learn um, I've been listening to a lot of country players I was absolutely flabbergasted how so many of the styles that the metal players of the 90s used were actually from old 50s guitarists like sweet playing um, yeah. you know the really fast alternate playing and, um, you know, hammer-ons and things um, that I can't believe it, but you, during the lockdown, I was doing a lot of, you know, listening to YouTube. So I came across these old black and white videos of <laughs> these old, you know, like 75 year old guys going, <laughs> wait a minute, this, this isn't right. And I just thought, this is incredible. I mean, people like Shet Atkins, you know, he's oh, yeah. an incredible player. You know, he can, when he's playing it, he just picks it up and starts playing and makes that sound so good. And a lot of country players, I think people like Johnny Highland, and I mean, there's so many, um, you know, um, Merle Travis, um, Jerry Reed, you know, all these people, Tommy Emmanuel. I mean, I, I started listening to these and thinking, crikey, I still got so much to learn, you know. Um, yeah, and that sort of influenced um, As Dead as a Dodo. And even, um, you know, all the songs uh, like uh, A Boy and His Dog and Phoenician Skies have got a different style of picking than I normally would have used. And that's come through listening to country players. That's what I like to do. You'll get something which is like the rap stuff, get something really left of center and then draft it into what we do with our melodies and our emotion and our lyrics, because then you're always producing something slightly new and different. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
because I, you know, when I write songs, I, tr I try to, um, inject as many different, I like as many different styles into it as possible, but it's hard to, I, I, I have a really, I don't really have a clear cut identity, but I think you guys definitely have, I mean, it still sounds like Pendragon, no matter what you do. It it's does, yeah, because the melodies, yeah. I mean, you, you know, we're at it long enough to be able to, um, you, you know, to look at what we've done over the years and there's something sort of, you can quite comfortably fit into a way of doing things. I, I think, you know, when you're quite young, like, <laughs> like you are, you know, there's, there's there's so many ways you can go. It's almost a bit over... Um, overwhelming to know where to go that's your thing i mean i'm kind of lucky that we can look back and think well you know be honest we're a prog rock band so that's the default with all this other stuff stuck to it i think you know when you're young there's so much stuff out there now it's a bit difficult to know you know quite where you want to go so um maybe that just takes time i don't know huh. um I, I think you you pretty much answered some of my other questions, like who are your main influences? Uh, well, I, I guess, uh, well, you mentioned some influences as a guitar player, like Jeff Beck and, and some other, you know, more country influences. Um, uh, as a singer and a songwriter, who, like, what influences would you say, or who well, has influenced you in that aspect? Fun, fun, funnily enough, uh, as a singer, um, the kind of singers that I really like are soul singers. Um, I, I, I like, I always liked rock singers, you know, like what I would call the typical rock singers. I mean, particularly people like Lou Graham um, and that kind of voice. I mean, I've always felt those people were very lucky. They could just open their mouth and they sounded good. <laughs> you know, I hated that because I used to have to fight so hard to try and, um, you know, get a decent sound because, you know, I'd sound quite nasally, but if I sing soul music, I can do it very well. But if I try and sing rock music, I struggle. I mean, over the years, my voice has sort of like got lower pitched. So it's better at doing um, rock stuff. But, um, you know, initially I could sing Michael Jackson stuff really easily. You know, my, my vocal register was very much in um, that, that area. I mean, if I ever did, um, you know, karaoke, I quite often used to do Billie Jean, you know, which I found huh. quite easy to do, uh, you know, because it was in my range and my sound was a little bit similar. It's very much, or, you know, I do like Me and Mrs. Jones by Billy Paul, you know, soul stuff really, really those singers really resonate with me. And, um, you, you know, like even now, I'm still coming across singers that just absolutely knock me over i mean like there's um there's a youtube there's a guy called eddie holman who was from uh you know had a hit single in the 70s called lonely girl and um he does a live version of it i think it's a, a theater in canada and a lot of it's in falsetto and it's probably the best vocal performance i've ever heard in my life that the emotion and the ability to do what he's doing it just it's just absolutely mind-bogglingly amazing. And um, you know, Johnny Wilder from um, Heat Wave, you know, singing always, always forever. It's just, I love that kind of sound. Those soul singers are just brilliant. But I, I've always liked the Michael Jackson, Sade, George Michael, that sort of soulful type of singer. I mean, someone like George Michael, you know, it, it just sounds good singing anything. Yeah. You know, there are some people like Sade, they, they just sound, they just start singing and they sound great, mm -hmm. you know, but for the rest of us, <laughs> it's a hell of a fight. Oh, um, yes. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, you know, and it's something that I'm still learning. And I think with uh, Love Over Fear, I was very, very happy with some of the vocal performances, the more happy than I've ever been, particularly stuff with world, like Whirlwind or Starfish in the Moon, which is vocally very exposed. Oh, yes. There's nowhere to hide, you know, so the vocal is very upfront. And I, I couldn't believe how they came out. I was extremely happy with the results on that album. Um, and, you know, also with uh, North Star as well, which was a different way of um 
you know, approaching the vocals from Love Over Fear. You know, you're just trying something a little bit different and something you don't know whether it's going to work. And, uh, you know, so recently I've been very happy with the vocals. So most of my influences are um, probably soul influences, but I still really like Phil Collins, you know, on, on stuff. You know, he sounds amazing on um, you know, Trick of the Tail, Wind and Mothering, you know. Peter Gabriel, fantastic. Yeah. You know, there's so many, you know, um, uh, Roland Orzabel from Tears of Fears. I always really liked his voice as well. There's so many. It's just like guitarists. There's <laughs> literally hundreds and hundreds that have had some sort of influence over the years for something you think, hey, I like what that guy's doing there. You know, maybe I could sort of like move some notes around you know, in that style to do something. And this is what keeps it exciting and interesting and new. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I, 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 you know, obviously I would have thought like, um, I, I wasn't sure what your influences were as in terms of a singer, but that's very interesting to see it's more soul based. And, you know, I, I can totally yeah. see that. Um, uh, maybe the, the, this is maybe a bit of a, you could maybe go many different ways with this question, but what does your guitar and vocal setup look like? And in particular, like what gear do you use? Um, um, it, it's like an unbelievably untidy <laughs> child's bedroom. <laughs> oh my God. I, I used to know this guy. In fact, he, he, he lives in America now and he, he's quite well known. He, he now works with Hans Zimmer. Oh, wow. Oh, he's a guy God. called Gavin Greenaway. And his father was a very well-known songwriter in the UK in the 60s and the 70s. He, his, his father wrote songs like I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing and uh, yeah, massive uh, The Pavement Beneath My Feet, um, Gene Pitney. These the huge hits. His son, Gavin, um, he, he, you know, I, I knew him um fairly well because he, he was in a circle of people and he actually mixed for us uh window of life um mm -hmm. but he went to america and um started working with hans zimmer and he was very involved in gladiator all the big sound scores gavin is involved in but when he was mixing window of life i've just never seen anyone so untidy he just kind of like oh <laughs> um i've got this reverb let's get plug that in and he'd be just walking around in his socks, you know, in the studio, just plugging things in. And like, if that wire didn't reach, he'd be like, pull it, pull it, pull the wires closer, plug it in. Because the inspiration was now. He had to, you know, he couldn't have, well, you know, we'll put that over there and have a nice tidy rack here and tidy rack there. He thought of an idea and it had to be then, you know. And I'm like that with the guitar stuff. Is I think of something, I plug it in, it's got to work, and it's hanging off the edge of the pedal board. And it, to be honest, it's a bit of a nightmare when you look at that. It paddles all over the place. I mean, for the tour, I've got it all kind of, you know, set up in a board now. But I mean, the pedal was just huge. I've got something like 18 pedals there. And, um, you know, I keep changing things around, and I, I use different amps. Uh, I, I use um, a Cornford. MK250H uh, Mark II and uh, a 4x12 orange cab and I use a Lazy J uh, 40 watt amp for most of the clean stuff but that, that's that been the touring rig for the last few years but uh, I've started to change that as well now uh, like the solo on Phoenician Skies I've started to use as one of my greatest ever, ever influences was a guy called Andy Latimer from Camel. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, once it was back in the 80s, oh, I can't get a sound. I don't know what. To... He said, get a rap pedal. Um, so eventually I did. And I've had this rap pedal and every so often I've drafted it back into my setup. And I've gone back to using that now for a lot of the lead sounds because it just sounds amazing. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. Um, Phoenician Skies, the solo of Phoenician Skies. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a, a great song. Great, great section of that that uh, North Star album. Um, 
how do you manage to play guitar and sing so effortlessly? Did it come easily to you or did you have to work hard? Well, I still have to work hard at it. I mean, like some bits, um, sometimes very, I mean, like it, there, there's a bit of wishing well, for example, where I, I've got to play da, 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 and it's a harmony of the vocal, but it, it, it's kind of, it strikes against what the vocal's doing. So I've got to approximate it um, you know, in some way that is acceptable to a live audience, but also is true to the original sound as well. I mean, I don't just stop if it gets difficult. I'll make damn sure I've got to do something. And there are some things which are incredibly awkward, like um, Soul and the Sea has got this arpeggio thing. I use a thumb pick. Uh, courtesy mm -hmm. of Tommy Emmanuel saying, oh, you should use a thumb pick. I thought, Man, maybe I should. So I started using it. I thought, yeah, you get a good sound on the, the bass using it. It's a bit tricky to get used to, but after a while, you can start doing amazing things with it. And so I started using the thumb pick. And the vocal line goes completely, it, it doesn't, work with that it goes it goes against it there's a couple of points so i have to approximate the vocal and i told the backing singers i said look you know there's going to be one point where um you know i jump in early on the beat here because the guitar is pulling that way and there's just no way i can play that and then come in off beat with the vocal so you know i have to tie things into um you know, make them work for a live situation, but um, it's something that I've got used to now. I mean, sort of playing lead particularly, or I'm trying to think of something where it is particularly difficult. I mean, you're thinking of two things. I mean, even something like, you know, afraid of everything. I mean, you know, you've got this vocal, which is kind of, you know, going over uh, the, the guitar pattern there, which is, you know, pretty much the same as, um, you know, Paul McCartney playing Blackbird or something like that. Um, so, you know, it's something that I've done for so long now, I'm sort of used to it, but there are times when it still can be a hell of a challenge. Um, I can't think of it. I mean, the, the examples I've given you, you know, are, fairly tricky oh yeah <laughs> sound it. They're, they're quite simple but if you actually start to try and sing um soul and the sea overdoing that arpeggio which is absolutely you know it's on the beat um it's quite hard to do <laughs> yeah yeah i mean soul and the sea is is just one of my favorite songs uh pendragon songs but also just one of my favorite songs and 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 i, I think yeah it's deceivingly complex when you consider the fact that you're singing and playing guitar and it's just you know but but yeah um i i that's very interesting to hear um uh i think so this is maybe a bit of an odd question but something that's special about pendragon other than the incredible music is the uh, beautiful album art um according to my research uh simon williams did the album artwork for the world the window of life masquerade overture not of this world and believe uh yeah. i think that's correct yes uh, is this the same Simon Williams who drew the Marvel comics? Because uh, when I looked it up, I just said I don't think so. Okay, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, because I looked, I was researching and I couldn't find much done, information about it's it. But. Quite possible. I mean, he he's done a lot of stuff, um, yeah. of you know, a lot of different stuff. I mean, I've seen some incredible stuff that he's done of Laurel and Hardy. Uh, they look like photographs. It's so good. Uh, but I don't know. But he's very kind of, um, he underplays things quite a lot. You know, he's, he's from Wales. So I said, if I said to him, Simon, did you do this Marvel comics? You know, I don't, you know, oh, yeah, he did do that quite a while ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so he already sort of says, you know, he doesn't blow his own trumpet. So yeah, sometimes he's, he's one of those people who's unbelievably talented. I mean, I give him a list of things as long as you're on that I want to see in an album cover. And I'm thinking, there's no way in the world he's going to be able to shoehorn in all these things and make it look good. 
Um, but he's got a phenomenal way of getting perspective. He'll think of something. He'll think of the things that are going to go in the back and how they, I mean, it's just remarkable. Yeah. Great to work with. I, I, very quick, you know, very, very accurate with what he does. Yeah, he's brilliant. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, um, definitely. Um, uh, this is more of a songwriter kind of question. So uh, uh, Paintbox off of the Masquerade Overture is is uh, one of my favorite songs uh, by Pendragon. Yeah, even even my dad loves it and he's not a particularly a fan of, um, you know, that kind of music, progressive rock, whatever you want to say it, uh, it is. Um, does writing a song like Paintbox or, or any Pendragon song for that matter come easily or does writing a song vary in terms of difficulty for you? Because I've always thought that, you know, I, I think, um, was it, uh, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, I, I just always thought that song kind of had a, it just felt like it, it came together really easily, but I, I don't know, maybe you could describe how that went. Well, it's weird because some songs do and some songs don't. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like Soul and the Sea, going back to that, it's just yeah. really, it was really easy. And yet um, the song, everything was a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know why. It just sometimes is the pacing of an album, you know, like you get three quarters of the way through and you ease up. You think, you know, you're not stressing anymore because you think, well, I got three quarters of the album now, you know, hey, the last bit can't be too difficult. And, you know, it can be quite easy. But then when you start the album, you think, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, the first thing that's going to make that statement. You know, how, where's, it, where, where's it going? What's it going to be? You know, there's all these un, unknown quantities. But with Paintbox, I think it was quite easy because, um, you know, it's pretty much a Pendragon format, which is verse, chorus, a tiny little solo, verse chorus then a long instrumental and then you often get a, a chorus at the end done in half time and then a sort yeah. of an outro part that that's quite um uh that was a sort of a template for love over fear as well yeah and I, I wanted to do that but um i, I don't paint box wasn't a particularly difficult song because mm -hmm. You know, once you've got the verse, once you've got the chorus, once you know what you're going to do in the solo, it's okay. Yeah, isn't isn't uh, the template for Paintbox? I think it's the same template as um, Breaking the Spell. I think, yeah. I think. Well, yeah, which is which is also a great song. Uh, obviously, it's it, one of your. I think you're one of my favorite solos from you. I mean, it's just like total shredding, but it's also very emotional, and you know, it's just great. Um, uh, now I I will um say this is maybe a bit of a deep question um uh, not of this world is my favorite pendragon album and uh i i have to say um given the extremely difficult circumstances around that time in your life um with like i think you had like a divorce or something or something along yeah. that lines um do you think that adversity sparks creativity yes um otherwise you know it, it's it's all too, it opens your eyes to something, you know, adversity. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's a guy, there's a young guy who comes comes around here and um, he does some work around here. And we, he's a musician as well. We're always talking about stuff. And he always says, um, he, you know, there was some great composer or something said, or writer, I can't remember. He said, you know, the thing is a lot of musicians, they've just got to, they've just got to live on the shit heap. <laughs> and there's kind of a lot of truth in that because you know when people have um you know negative experiences it opens their eyes and when their eyes are opened they become creative and want to write about it and then the hope is that other people will share in those feelings or you'll be able to impart some kind of mutual understanding to other people who are going through a similar thing i mean no better example is there than phil collins you know oh yeah he made an entire solo career out of getting divorced <laughs> <laughs> the thing is for me it, it 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 was you know obviously at the time and it was a nightmare but 
then afterwards you look at it and think, well, you know, it's opened my eyes to, um, it's the first album, I think, that really had some meaningful emotional content. Um, you know, before that, it, you know, Paintbox, it's kind of, it's nice little message in there and, you know, Masters of Illusion. But for me, the vocal um, strength of Not of This World was, you know, was really laying that those emotions on the line. Oh yeah, which I like. I I I don't have a problem with doing yeah. that. You know, I some people are afraid of, you know, being too sentimental or sensitive or emotional. Well, I'm not. You know, get it out there, put it down. That's what you want. That's what I want. That's what I feel I want to do. I don't have a problem with doing that. In fact, I like it because I'm thinking maybe this will reach someone else who's thinking you know uh some, uh, going through a similar thing or having some problems with something you know and music is very very therapeutic you know there's nothing quite like having something where people go yeah i know what you mean you know um i mean there were a lot of people um you know who wrote in who uh when the album came out just afterwards who said you know they felt they were going through a divorce and they felt the same way and it was very comforting to think that someone else was also on the shit heap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean I listen to songs like uh like If I Were the Wind Wind and You Were the Rain. And I mean the, the it's almost I feel like I'm almost intrude intruding almost, like reading the lyrics. It's it's very, very personal, but it's so moving, you know, it's it's incredibly powerful, especially the end section with just you and Clyde Nolan, you know, on, on piano. Right, um, it's just gorgeous, but yeah, yeah. The 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 end bit of that um, that was quite funny because um, w when I was writing it, it was it was in the summer, and uh, I had the windows open, and I was playing that piano part, and my ex wife was downstairs outside. And we were already going through the sort of the breakup. And so, you know, I had the windows open and I just thought, huh, I'm going to turn this up a little bit so she can hear it. You know, so it was quite loud. And I just, I didn't hear anything at the end of the day. Um, I went downstairs and she said, I heard that music drifting outside. And she said, um, I, that, that really started pulling on my heartstrings. Wow. That's what I thought. Good. That's the effect. <laughs> <laughs> Have some of that. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was quite an interesting little moment. Yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um. And yeah, we already talked about pure. Um. I personally, I never uh, cared for the neo prog label that has been slapped on. To your name uh and and many other bands that are within that genre how do you feel about being categorized under that i don't really mind any names you know i life's too short to really i mean okay and you know people um you know some some people you know like to consider that they're not this or they're not that or they are this or they are that and they don't like being pigeonholed and, yeah I, I get that but personally, I, I don't give a I don't give a hoot. I don't care. You know, the the only thing I care about really is the music. You know, whether it's good, um, you know, whether it reaches people. You know that that that's the only thing that counts. I mean, there's, um, you know, that the, there are a lot of musicians that say, you know, I I, I don't like being pigeonholed. But, you know, they're influenced by something somewhere. Yeah. It's going to cut, you know, it, so if somebody says, oh, yeah, they're kind of quite a metal band, you get kind of an idea. You think, oh, maybe, you know, I'm this and that then. Or, I mean, it can also put people off as well. I mean, that's that's a big problem with it. But, you know, let's be honest. I mean, Pendragon was never going to really be that. I mean, yeah, OK, but the Neo Prog thing have really stopped us becoming mainstream. I don't know maybe not i don't know but it doesn't bother me i i don't i don't really get upset about it i just find it kind of amusing sometimes that people 
I think it was on Prog Archives, have broken down about 30 different categories, you know, of math prog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't care about all that. I, I, you know, if you want to be scientific, go, go to the laboratory and put some shit in test tubes. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it doesn't, it's, it's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, I kind of like I I'm glad people do that because it means they sort of care and it's kind of amusing as well. But for them, I think they take it quite seriously. You know? Oh yeah, totally. Do yeah. That, great. It's like people that want to do um you know, you get people like really strange hobbies. You think, what the heck would you want to do? They like collect bean bean tins from uh -huh. around the world, and you just think. Is that a hobby? Is, is that a thing? You know, but you know, it keeps them occupied. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Do that. They're great. But I, as long as I don't have to do it, <laughs> as long as you don't impose it onto my yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, There's a guy out in the, um, in, I think it's the Arizona desert. Uh, just before you get to California, because um, a few years ago I did the Route 66 on a Harley and um, came across this. There's this guy who lives in the middle of nowhere. I think this could be near um, San Bernardino, I think, which I think is in California, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he lives out in the middle of nowhere and he's just got all this stuff hanging from. I think it originally was trees, but now it's just hanging wow. everywhere. It's thousands of bottles <laughs> and other things like surfboards, horseshoes, um, lamps, mugs, but mostly it's just bottles. And if you just say to him, like, you know, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. I, I just collect shit, man. <laughs> and you just think, yeah, he's got it right. Yeah. yeah just like you know we we collect various maybe albums or, or guitars you know it's like it's everybody has their own kind of it's interesting because people stop off there to look you know people go there to have a look at the stuff that he's got and i think yeah i get it it's amazing. Yeah, right? it's some kind of weird surreal futurist <laughs> town you know but that that's what he does that's his thing it's great mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's funny because you mentioned something earlier about like maybe your music would reach out to more people if it wasn't pigeonholed in that progressive rock label. But then again, who knows, right? Um, I think Pendragon for me always had like a pop element to their music. Um, yeah. And I think Kowtow is the, is the closest the band has come to fully embracing that. Um, what made you because i think of like a song like um explorers of the infinite mm -hmm. if that song was maybe four minutes i could totally see that on the radio it's such a it's like a very poppy song you know it's very accessible i think so like yeah. what made you steadfast in wanting to write progressive rock and, and make something 11 minutes if it could only be six minutes which by the way I, i'm glad you made it 11 minutes but i just think like what like what made you so set steadfast in, in writing progressive rock? Well, I suppose because um, we um, started uh, as the band uh, as a rock band, and then I loved Genesis and Camel and Pink Floyd, and so I, I wanted to progress more into having keyboards. So we brought John Barnfield in as keyboard player, and we just really worked together well started writing a lot of um stuff which just we, we wanted to write we thought hey you know genesis we want to write stuff like this is we love this music and you know at that time we, we had no idea whether it was popular or not you know we just liked that sound but i've always really liked pop music i like a lot of pop music there's a there's there's a lot of you know really great particularly the 60s and the 70s, um, you know, amazing songs. Um, to me, some of the best songs, you know, ever written. Also the 80s as well. And, you know, even now, I mean, I can listen to 
um, you know, some stuff by Ariana Grande and just think that is just such a good song. <laughs> Katy Perry, you know, and Justin Bieber or Harry Styles, right? I don't, yeah. know, I don't know any Justin Bieber stuff at all. Yeah. Uh, he released I, a song during the pandemic, which I, I really like, but I, I don't know. I forgot what it's called. I think it's like Lonely or something, which is kind of relevant to the time. But, you know, there's a there's a lot of great pop music, which I think, you know. Yeah, there is. there's a lot of great music. I mean, you know, the, I like the new metal stuff. I like the, the rap stuff that my son used to play. You know, like I said about the Eminem thing, there's, you know, there's something in everything and if you you know give stuff a chance i mean i always say to people you know like well if you don't like listen when i first started out this guy lent me lamb lies down on broadway a tape of it and i just thought man this is so wordy and there's so it's two of these albums as well this complicated english kind of music i i couldn't get my head around it i thought i, I don't really like it to be honest and then I kept playing it, kept playing it, kept playing it. And then one day I thought, I came in from school and I put it on and I thought, this is the best music I've ever heard in my life. Suddenly, Carpet Crawlers, you oh. know, Genesis just dropped and all of a sudden everything made sense. Now, if I hadn't persevered with that music, I would not have got into prog rock and then I wouldn't have been playing this sort of music. So... You know, you, sometimes music is a hell of a challenge and it's worth, I mean, like opera is the same. You know, I, I listen to a lot of opera because my dad lived in um, in Vienna in Austria. So we used to go and see a lot of live operas. I used to go with my sister as well. And initially it's like, ah, oh, man, you know, this is two hours of this kind of wailing. You know, it's <laughs> difficult. But then you find a melody somewhere, you think, wait a minute, like Mozart's, um, you know, Mass in C is absolutely unbelievable piece of music. Uh, really, really beautiful piece of music. And um, so, you know, there's an awful lot out there to be enjoyed. And that goes all the way across to, um, you know, heavy metal, rap music, you, you know, a lot of pop music that's out there. There's people, there's a lot of people doing good stuff. I mean, uh, Calvin Harris, I, I heard, and I think he did a song with uh, Katy Perry. I just like really, really liked it. I thought this is a great pop song, mm -hmm. you know, brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, also, this isn't really a question. I just thought I had to mention this because um, it's such a poignant lyric for me. Um, it's And it's from one of my favorite Pendragon songs, um, uh, This Green and Pleasant Land. And the lyric is... Um, uh, I, I believe it's like Christmas is a word you can no longer say anymore. Something. I love that. I love that. You know, uh, yeah. Was What's that? Like a, oh, sorry, what? Sorry, go on. Sorry. But what, oh, no, no. I just, I, I, I was thinking like, um, like, I, I think that was maybe a little bit after like the, the war on Christmas or something like that. But it was just like such a powerful line because it, especially now, I think, because like, you know, my, uh, not to mention my my own life much, but my dad is a professor at a university, and they had like this email that was sent out to everyone. And they were like, "Oh, you can't you can't say these like it's a taboo word almost like Christmas to to celebrate oh. it." And it's like really oh. interesting, but yeah, it's quite it's, it's it is actually interesting what you say. And I don't know if your dad's gonna would listen to any of this, but yeah, <laughs> I, I I I'm quite interested in what's happening in American universities at the moment because there is um uh, in, in in many places there's a tremendous marxist influence that's uh creeping through and i've heard you know a, a lot of students in america talk about wanting to bring back communism which is yeah. quite interesting because that, that that i mean you know people always idealize the these kind of ideologies without really much thought yeah because <laughs> what you really need to do is you need to go away and read some books by solzhenitsyn and um you know uh, some other books about the soviet union to really understand you know what that means i mean i've even heard this argument where people say well you know stalin killed 60 million people and they will say yeah, but Stalin got it wrong, you know. Like if if if, if I were dictator, 
<laughs> yeah, and you just think, well, you know, and most of it's sort of emotional hysteria. And what the best thing that people could do is it, with this sort of influence, it, it, I mean, it's fear. People do this out of fear, political correctness, which is what this green and pleasant land is all about, is about stopping people being offended. But you, you can't stop people being offended. We're, I, I, I'm offended that 10 million people don't buy my albums. But you know what? It's tough luck. Yeah. And the reality is, is that I'm actually not offended at all. Um, I, I have to say, I have to look within and I have to say the reason why we're not a huge band is that we just don't write very popular music. Yeah. That's the way it is. And But I'm extremely happy with what I do do. I don't blame other people for this or for that. And, I, I you know, and it's the same with, with Green and Pleasant Land. You know, I've had some ideas here about, um, you know, mainly that song is railing against political correctness. And, um, you know, that line, I mean, somebody said, um, they called me, they said, that's ridiculous what he's saying about Christmas is a word you can't say. What a stupid thing to say. Well, actually, in the UK, that particular year, there were seven... Um, councils in the UK were trying to stop the word Christmas being um, talked about in when people sent greetings cards, Christmas cards. Yeah. You know, so you know the sort of stamping out of Christian ideas um, and you know, which which was very much a, you know a communist thing. You know, like Stalin wanted to get rid of all uh, religion altogether, but. You know, uh, spirituality has given people an un unbelievably good rudder um, over the last, wow. you know, uh, let's call it 5,000 years. Wow. Um, you know, it gives people some idea about what are good things. And there are people who say, well, we would have done that anyway. Well, you know, that's something we don't know about. You know, if you read Tolstoy, uh, The Kingdom of Heaven is Within, you know, he, he talks about the way. Um, these epochs of mankind, you know, where they initially we, we were like savages and we needed some kind of way, um, you know, to point which was going to be the right thing to do. Nobody can say, well, we would have turned out, you know, with good values anyway, because intrinsically, actually, people are quite selfish and, you know, maybe we wouldn't have been like this without you know, the Ten Commandments. So, yeah. you know, I still think, um, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things out there which are very, very difficult subjects, you know, like equality. Um, it's a very hard thing to enforce. What you really need to do is you need to change people from with People need to change themselves from within. I mean, you know, we have girls you know using that for, for example you know the, the um uh having uh you, you know equality between men and women um you know we have two backing singers in the band and we had a lighting tech who's a girl and i i i'm not thinking anything i'm just thinking these are people i'm not thinking oh we need to give them more you know because how are they going they, they will feel they got this for nothing if I think of it in any other way, apart from the people who come here to do a job, you know, we, we got Vinny, who's um, from um, uh, the Philippines, you know, so he's got some dark skin, but I'm not thinking, you know, he's a dark skin person. We need to make exceptions for. I'm just thinking he's a guy who's who, who, who we love. He's a great drummer. You know, yeah. I, 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 that, you know, these things come from within. I, I don't need to make any laws to make this happen. Yeah. You know, um, Green and Pleasant Land is, um, it's about, I would like people to, you know, go away and do more reading about things, you know, like if you want communism, you don't want the word um, Christmas in, uh, in, in our vocabulary, go and read books about how this ended up for, um, you know, communist Soviet Union and uh, China 
and you know also germany yeah so you know yeah or even like uh you know cancel culture right that's like a big kind of thing i mean it's it's totally... yeah I, I know it is but you know i i don't do social media so i i i i one of the reasons for that is because of this is that is the, is the time framework in which things work people make a comment and people then react within two seconds you know in, in an ideal world people would say well they have more consideration over what have been some, someone might say something or someone might go away and say well you know i'll go and read some books on that and i'll get back to you in two months when i'm educated about what you're saying but they don't because people have become emotionally invested in all this stuff to the point where the logical mind is just shutting down. And the narcissism that's going with this, like people used to say, kids used to say, you know, I wonder what's at the top of Kilimanjaro. I wonder what crocodiles eat. I wonder what's on the other side of the world. Well, now, you know, all they're saying is, hey, I wonder what people are saying about me. Yeah. You know, and the world has become very uh, narcissistic and self-focused about things, and I, that, I think that's through, uh, you know, you know, social media. Is quite Definitely. Late. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, people are at a younger and younger age are being exposed to the dangers of social media and, and technology and whatever. And and you know, it's not like that technology is per se or social media is bad per se. It just you know, I just think the way it's the algorithm yeah. works no, in terms yeah. of yeah in terms of it's it's like a drug when people are susceptible to i mean i call television a drug you know yeah. I, I don't i don't watch tv because it people just stare at it yeah <laughs> i just think you know what you know what what do you why don't you learn to speak chinese or why don't you go surfing or why don't you make some raffia work baskets anything but just yeah. staring at this thing that's just like going, blah, 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 blah. You know, yeah. okay, sometimes a bit of mindless TV is fantastic. You know, if you've been working hard and you, you want you want to just switch off, absolutely brilliant. But it becomes like a drug. And I think, you know, social media has become like that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it would be great if people... Um, I, I think the younger generation are starting to get it now. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time, you know... There's going to be a backlash, and um, there are great people out there who are fighting um, for us to stay sane. I mean, people like Jordan Peterson, I, I like what he says a lot, and um, you know, people like Ben Shapiro, um, <laughs> amazingly entertaining. Yes. Uh, but yeah. the way he uh, shuts people down, you know, is 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 very good. Um, but, you know, people take offense. Ah, you know, he's sort of saying this against, you know, certain minorities. But, you know, you have to be thicker skinned. I mean, life makes you thicker skinned. I, I mean, I've had 45 years of people saying, do you know what? Your music is shit. And I just say, you don't have to buy it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so... We all get it. I mean, some guys, you know, have to work in a factory and there's a guy every single day telling them, you have got to do what I say. So nobody's got an easy gig. Everybody, you know, whether you're uh, you know, black, white, male, female, gay, straight, whatever. Yeah. Everybody has got their, um, their tough gig. Oh, just, yeah. just in case of the way you look at it. And I, I, yeah, I think the line, uh, take only what you need and be on your way. Yeah. Perfectly encapsulates that kind of idea, right? And and yeah, it's, it's absolutely great. Um, I recently, um, uh, I, th I think I only have a couple questions left, but recently um, I interviewed the band Galahad and uh, I purchased their book, um, One for the Record, which you actually can... Uh, there's a there's a couple moments where you contributed to it and uh um you actually had some things to say about the band and how they opened for you in the 80s i think um uh and uh the, I, I won't ask anything particularly about the book but um would you ever consider writing and publishing a memoir of your life or the history of pendragon 
I'm actually working on it now. Um, I, I started during the lockdown. I've got about half that. I thought you better start writing this stuff down before you forget. <laughs> because yeah. there's so much. I mean, the, the, I want, I didn't just want to write the kind of thing about, you know, just, you know, in 1985, the jewel was released and da 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 left the yeah. band. I wanted it to have two elements on top of that. One was that I wanted it to have some moments that were amusing, yeah, um, some funny things. And the other thing, I wanted it to be able to appeal to people who didn't know anything about the band, who just wanted to know about somebody's, um, the road that somebody had taken from being, you know, a kid at school who failed all his, all his exams all the way through to, um, you know, running my own record label and, and playing music for a living 45 years later. You know, th there's there's an interesting story in that. And there's an awful lot of, you know, hardships early on, you know, in the thing, which people like those sort of roller coasters. They, they don't want it to be, well, they got a record deal and got famous and made loads of money. That's a boring story. Yeah. What I want to hear about is that, you know, you 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 were stuck in the snow in Glasgow where there was um, some, you know, people trying to break down the door to get to you. you know, they want to hear this stuff. And that, that's what we, we had all these kinds of stories. Definitely. So, yeah, I, I, I'm well on the way with that. I write a little bit more for it every day. I mean, it's not all about Pendragon. A lot of it's about my life. And uh, I mean, you know, I've got a whole um, at the moment. Tomorrow, today, I was writing a whole part about wetsuits, you know, because <laughs> I like surfing. And oh, this yeah. is about wetsuits, which you know, it's quite amusing. Um, some of the, the, the things that I'm talking about were there, but I, you know, I, I, I really enjoy writing. I and I want to write another book after this one as well, which is going to be a lot more serious about, um, you know, my uh, my ideas about you know, the world, the universe and everything. And, um, you know, I've got some very strong ideas about, you know, what the, what the way things are. And I'd like to write them down. Definitely, yeah. Um, my, my final question uh, is, how have you managed to keep Pendragon alive and strong after 40 plus years? Well, we're very, very lucky that uh, the hub of the band, which is me, Peter and Clive, you know, have kept showing up <laughs> you know i mean they're amazing guys i mean they really are and we were very lucky that initially when we started we said to clive you know we we already had trouble with uh you, you know people writing and musical differences but clive we said to clive we don't want any more songwriters you know we just want someone to play some keyboards yeah okay wow. so you know there was never any kind of tension you know between be, brought about due to creativity differences and peter is very easy to work with as regards so we we wrote a lot of stuff early on and you know we have the same kind of approach to how we like music so we're very lucky that uh it's like a marriage you know after a while you get over all those initial hurdles of people you know like leaving their leaving their leaving the cap off the toothpaste tube and leaving their shoes outside, <laughs> you know, their dirty socks outside. You get past all those sort of things and you just say, well, you know, hey, everyone has their own foibles, you know, me included. And, um, you know, you, you just kind of have more of a harmony. Um, I mean, there's been some tremendously difficult periods of time, you know, where we've nearly had to sort of say, I think we're going to have to pack this in. But, to me now, this is like the icing on the cake. We've got through a lot of our troubles and the band lineup. And, you know, Vinny is just such a great guy and such a brilliant drummer. And the, the girls who do the backing singing live and um, Rog plays in 12 string. I mean, we, we've just enjoyed each other's company so much. And, you know, everyone's been through a lot of shit over the years and they just don't want any more. So, you know, they want to see this as something they can really enjoy. And, it's just an amazing thing to be part of now. But, you know, 45 years, I mean, one of the best things we ever did, two things. One, we met Marillion, which gave us the, the opportunity to play at the Marquee Club, which then blossomed onto doing tons of other shows. 
And the other thing was starting our own record label in 1987, which we were the only band that could not get a record deal. You know, IQ, 12th Night, you know, they, they, Palace, they all got record deals. We did not. We could not get a deal. But we started our own, our, our own label, which meant that we could financially, you know, do better uh, than being signed to a record label and we could steer our own course so i mean i know bands that signed to record labels but you know the a and r man men have started to pitch each other but the band members against each other you know like I, there's a band a very well-known band who i know the record company tried to get the band to kick the guitarist out and i guess oh. who it is they didn't think that he moved around enough. <laughs> and you know, this is going to create, it's not, you know, you've got to, you got to, you can't have all that shit going on. You know, you've got to no. work with the people. If they're trouble, yeah, they got to go. But, you know, it's a very hard thing to be signed to a record label and have people giving all their opinions on what you should be doing. Was that band that you were referring to, uh, Marillion? I uh, I can't say. Oh, you can't say because I know Marillion had a similar thing where Steve Rothery, the, the somebody tried to get Steve, but that was like in the eighties. It was it was a while ago, but yeah. Well, it was Marillion. It oh, it wasn't. It was Marillion. Oh, it was Marillion. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Maybe you, I, were, you already you already know the story then. So. Yeah, I yeah. I read that in the uh, script for Jester's Tier Deluxe Edition. Yeah. There's like a documentary where they mentioned that. So, uh, yeah, but that, that's it's funny. Um, well, I, I think this was a very in-depth, very uh, thought-provoking conversation that we had, uh, especially with certain things that we talked about. Um, thank you so much for your time. I seriously cannot thank you, thank you enough. I mean, I, I will, I'm a Pendragon fan for life. I, I am huge, oh, yeah. huge inspiration to me as a guitar player, songwriter, singer, whatever you want to say. And, and, you know, um, even, you know, uh, the other musicians, Peter G, Clive Nolan, you know, I, and, and uh, yeah, Vinny and, and all those people are just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And um, I, it's unfortunate because I don't know if I'll ever be able to see the band live, uh, but um, unless you toured in North America or the US, I don't know, but um, I'm not sure what that. I wish we could. Yeah, right. Yeah, but uh Anyway, thank you so much uh, for your time. Well, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, um, uh, you know, take care. Yeah, and you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>